Okay, so we are on. Okay, so thank you, uh, Dr. Lucien van, van der Meer. Am I saying that correctly? Yes, absolutely. From Holland. Um, and uh, who is going to talk about well, the impact of HD on, on young people. Um, and this was a, a study that we saw a, we saw you present a couple of years ago and actually um, we absolutely love this, this study. So uh, it's right up our street. It, it helps us show uh, the the need for services for young people in HD family. So we're really happy that you, that you did it. <laughs> um, but go ahead and, and show people what you've been up to. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity to do this. I uh, One technical thing, I can see part of my slide. You should have to see all of it. Is it up now? It's, yeah. It's it's a bit small, I think, and the sides are missing. It should be OK. On my screen, it should be full, so it should be good for everyone else. OK, I hope I can read what I want to read in the, in the meantime. So um, I will talk about the topic that I, um, I sent to you, Matt. It's growing up with a parent who has HD. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about childhood experiences of persons who grew up with a parent who was affected with HD. And um, I'll tell you something about what we know about the consequences of such a background for later life. Uh, let me first introduce myself a little bit. Uh, are you in control of the slides, Matt? I am. So you have to tell me if, you, if I'm if I'm no good. You tell me. Yeah, there's a few animations in as well. So yeah, yeah. just keep on going if you can. <laughs> yeah, I can see just a part of it. So I think I. Mm. You should be able to make it bigger on your screen. Let me see. I have to try. Yeah, I'm fine now. Yeah. Yes. So um, I'll tell you something about my clinical work with HD, uh, people who are affected with HD or are at risk, and some of my research that Matt was talking about. So first, something on adverse childhood experiences, and then something about how this can lead to a certain vulnerability in later life. Um, part of my work is predictive testing, so um, I will relate what I um, present to you to persons who come from predictive testing, and then I will uh, finish up with um, what we can do to prevent psychological harm for next generations. Can you continue? So I work in the Leiden University Medical Center, where I work with um, uh, clinical geneticists who make pedigrees of families so when there is a hereditary disease. So it's about DNA. And um, as I'm a psychologist, you can see on the left uh, bottom part of the slide that I'm trying to pull some strings to understand what is happening to people emotionally and psychologically. And then um, there's uh, another picture of uh, my thesis that I, that I wrote with the title People Who Need People, because I will explain to you next, um, it's all about relationships. Um, so part of my work is people who come for predictive testing. I offer psychological counseling before, during, and after testing. Um, and we stick to the international guidelines that were updated a couple of years ago. The people that I see come by themselves, but mainly they come with a, a partner or another support person. Um, so what, what do we know about people who are at risk for HD? What do I talk about with people? I talk about their uncertainty about being at risk or not. They sometimes, or if they come to us, they mostly want to take the predictive test. So we talk about decision making. Is it a good idea? Is it going to bring something good? Or do people expect um, unwanted um, uh, uh, consequences of an unfavorable test result? We talk about relationships with siblings, with parents, with partners. And a lot of people tell about childhood experiences with HD. Also, when we talk about predictive testing, many people have family planning in mind. They want to have, uh, they would like to have a, a child or several children. And also, people talk about future disease. What if we get to know that the disease is going to affect me or our family? 
Um, so, and also a lot about family communication. And of course, as everyone who is um, uh, in this field knows, there are a lot of emotions and we can expect various psychological reactions. So a lot of things to talk about. Um, what do I hear when I talk to people who are at risk? Sometimes they tell me quite impressive stories. Some people say my parent was affected as long as I can remember. It's very rare that people know exactly what was the point when their parent became affected. So sometimes it affected their whole childhood and adolescence and they cannot remember their parent being healthy. Uh, we know, of course, that the parent with HD may have had psychiatric psychiatric problems like depression or apathy um, or irritability and that's why the parents behavior may have been unpredictable or threatening sometimes even with some aggression and we know from other studies not mine but other studies that there is a higher chance of divorce of parents when one of the parents has HD um, all of this can be the the cause of the parent not being able to fulfill their tasks as a parent and this is true for the, the affected parent but also the other parent who may have ha have a lot of caring tasks and other things. Mm -hmm. um, so it happens that the child that is raised in this family or several children um, may have had to assume parental tasks that other people, uh, other children will not have to do at that age. So we want to know, hearing all these stories, um, does that lead to a psychological vulnerability? Does it make people more vulnerable for psychological problems? We know, in general, that growing up in difficult circumstances is related to emotional and relational and psychological problems in childhood and later life. So we were curious to know what would um, what would happen in the HD population. So the main question of my uh, research was uh, to find out if in the HD population there is a relationship between childhood experiences, so what happens in early life, and psychological characteristics in later life. And the focus of the whole study was on family relationships and partner relationships, so that's why I chose the title People Who Need People. And we compare the HD population, persons at risk, with people who are at risk for other genetic disorders, um, either neurological or forms of cancer. And we also compared this population with controls, so people who don't have a genetic disease in their family. The first part of the study was on childhood experiences. We wanted to know if there are more adverse, so negative childhood experiences in, um, uh, reported by persons who come from a family where a parent has or had HD and the participants were the people who came for predictive testing being at 50% risk. We measured the childhood experiences with a questionnaire and we compared this group with controls. So this is a whole list of adverse childhood experiences that can happen to a person. This was not made for the HD population, but for populations in general. I will talk you through it. There is going to be some red uh, squares. So, um, if yes, you can see that the middle column is the HD population and the right column is controls. And if you look completely down, you see that um, in the group of HD offspring, so the, the persons who were raised by a parent with HD, more than half, more than 52% of them said, yes, one of these things happened to me before I was 16 years of age. And we see that 24, 25% in the control group reported any adverse experiences. Uh, so, um, I defined dysfunctional parenting as having one of the problems that appear on the slides now. So either the parent has psychiatric, psychiatric problems or there was reported domestic violence in the family or the parent used alcohol or drugs or the parent did a suicide attempt at some point. So if any of these did occur, we um, I class, classified that as dysfunctional parenting. We see that one in three from the HD 
population report such an event and only 13 in the normal population. If we go to the top, we see that 28% of the HD population says my parent was affected before I was 16. And we see that, of course, other parents can uh, have a disease as well, but that was only 14% in the control group. Psychiatric problems of a parent were quite uh, um, common, 21% against only three in the general population. And lastly, it's not a significant difference, but we see that abuse, an experience of abuse, sexual or physical, is more common in the HD population than in normal populations. So to sum it up, I have another slide where I, yeah, um, where I show it in a bit more uh, um, general language, I think. Over half of the people who come from a background with HD have at least one adverse childhood experience is one of the things that were in the list. And so it's much more than in a control group. And almost 30% had a parent who was ill before they were 16, with almost 22% who had a parent with psychiatric problems. And one in three grew up with a parent who we think was not fully able to fulfill the parental tasks properly. And we see in this study that it does matter um, at what time the parent is affected. If it's when the, per the person was still very young, then it has more influence on life, of course, than when a person was already 15 or 16 years of age. So um, that's where we found the difference. So people who who are exposed to their parents' um, disease when they are still young are more at risk for um, unfavorable consequences. So the, the first study says that, yes, adverse childhood experiences are relatively common in HD families. And what we know from previous studies done by Vamos and Falstein uh, years ago is that looking back, adult HD offspring say that parenting of their parents was poor. It's defined, of course, in the paper that was written on this. Um, and they say that um, the, the family relationships was not as good they, as, as, as they would have wished. And we see from another study that in later life, almost half of offspring, so people who were raised by a parent with HD, have psychological problems, either mood problems, behavioral problems, or personality problems, and especially when the, the parent was affected when they were still very young. Now, we wanted to know, how can it be that if you have a child with HD, you might have problems in later life? There must be a, a link between these two. So that was the second study that we did. We wanted to know if persons who grew up with a parent with HD are more likely to have an insecure attachment style. I know that this is not common knowledge, common language, so we'll explain in a minute what that is. But first, we know that adverse childhood experiences can lead to vulnerability in later life. And we think that maybe a parent who has HD, with all the characteristics that we know, may be less sensitive to their children's needs and may be less consistent in their behavior and sometimes may be a bit unpredictable. And for the non-affected parent, we think that maybe because of the whole burden of care and worries, the parent may be less available for children. And that's why children may develop a lack of trust in parents and also in other people. And this would increase the risk of an insecure attachment style. So what is attachment? It is the tendency that we all have to seek proximity of others, especially when we are in difficult circumstances. We all know, it's a little background, we all know the study that was done, done on rhesus monkeys when they had the choice between a very cold and uh, steel-made uh, artificial mother who had milk or a cuddly and soft um, artificial mother, they would choose the softness. So that tells you that we seek warmth and tenderness um, even over food if it's necessary. Um, the second uh, image is of Conrad Lawrence who found out that in this uh, case little geese um, have a tendency to follow an, uh, another trustworthy, hopefully, person 
to, to increase their chances of survival. And then the third image is of John Bowlby, who is the godfather of attachment theory. So everything I say and did in my study is uh, I, I owe to him in a way. We all develop a personal attachment style. It originates in childhood because we see what our parents do and we uh, um, have interactions with them and that develops a certain way of thinking about relationships and trust in other persons. And an attachment style can be secure or insecure, which I will explain a bit later. And if a parent is sensitive, if the parent does understand what the child needs and does know what to do when a child is not feeling well, then the attachment style that occurs and that is the result will be secure. And we know that a personal attachment style, again, as we all have, is a blueprint print for relationship with a partner and other persons. And it is especially active when circumstances are difficult. It influences the way we deal with difficult emotions like being uh, sad or being upset or being anxious and that's where when we tend to attach to other people we know that an attachment style is strongly connected to psychological well-being in general so if to to understand a bit what happens between parents and children and how this is uh, connected to an attachment style i will show you the following slide is the parent sufficiently available or sensitive to the child's needs? That's the first question. If the parent is mainly available and knows what the child needs, that the child can feel safe, can trust others, feel confident, and can play, explore, make contact with other people, and will hopefully result in being a psychological, stable, sociable adult. That's what we call a secure attachment style. If the child is not very available or doesn't understand what the child needs, then the child may feel unsafe and have little confidence in self and others. And there's two ways that a child can react. It can avoid contact or try to get the parent to do what it needs, or so to, to desperately see contact. If this happens uh, consistently, then there is a risk that the a uh, child may turn into an adult with psychological problems or relational problems, and that's what we call an insecure attachment style. So a secure attachment style could be um, illustrated by this image. This person is confident that others will help when help is needed and trusts that she herself, in this case she, can cope with difficult things. If you have a, an insecure attachment style that is colored by anxiety, then it means that you fear that others will not be there to support you when you have difficulties, when you find yourself in, in, in trouble, and that you think that you cannot deal with difficult things on your own. So it's an anxious, insecure attachment style. The other form, and the last form that, form that I will show you is people who think that it is maybe not wise to turn to other people in, in difficult circumstances. They think they can take care of themselves, uh, they don't need others, they don't trust others, and they think that they are able to cope with difficult situations themselves. So that's three forms. We have secure attachment style, anxious attachment style, and avoidant attachment style. So the results of the second study um, with the question, are persons who grew up with a parent who has HD more likely to have an insecure attachment style? We, of course, again, compared the HD group to controls and we used the questionnaire to measure attachment style. What do we see? We see that HD offspring have more attachment anxiety. So if you look at the, uh, the image, you see that this is an anxious person who doesn't trust um, others to be available when they need them. And, it's, and it predicts problems with relationships, fear of rejection, problems with intimacy, intimate relationships, and also with being autonomous enough to, to cope with difficulties. People have less social support and when they have um, difficult emotions, they have trouble regulating them and calming down. What are the risk factors for such an attachment anxiety uh, uh, style? Um, if people have more adverse childhood experiences that we found in the first part of the study, 
that has a higher risk of having insecure attachment and also having an ill parent before age 16, the risk is higher and especially when there were psychiatric problems of the parent when they were young. So these are the risk factors for developing an insecure attachment style. And we think, again, that people with HD may be less available for their children, may be less sensitive to what their children need, and if they have psychiatric problems like irritability or depression or apathy, they can be unpredictable for the child. So what do we conclude from this study? We conclude that persons who grow up with a parent who has HD have a higher chance of having problems with relationship, with relationship because they have an insecure, anxious attachment style, especially when their parent was ill and they were young. So it's a risk. It's not to say that every person who grew up with HD, with a parent with HD, has relation problems uh, or has an insecure attachment style. But the risk is higher. And as a result of this, people may have little support in difficult circumstances, which causes negative emotions to be more intense and to last longer, and they are more vulnerable to psychological problems. Third study, the last part, uh, we wanted to know how this affects the, the procedure of predictive testing. We wanted to know if persons who have an insecure attachment style experience more psychological problems during the stressful um, time of predictive testing. We know that uh, most people experience this uh, time as, as, as difficult, stressful, it raises all kinds of emotions, and we know that after receiving the result, most people do quite well. This is true for people who have an unfavorable result, who know they are a carrier of HD, they may have a difficult time at first, but most people adapt quite well. Also, non-carriers and partners of these two groups, they cope well. And we know that they cope better when the result was needed to make choices, for instance, about family planning or making a career decision or anything like that. So people adjust better when they know why they did the predictive test. We know that a subgroup of just about 15% needs additional psychological counseling because they are not able to regulate their emotions so well. They need to adjust to the new perspective of being a carrier or maybe not being a carrier. They may experience uncertainty. They may uh, fear symptoms already having started. There may be relational problems and sometimes people have uh, want some support. Um, because they want to inform their children, want to know how to do that, and also a lot of questions are on family planning. So there's a group that needs some more um, attention. So what are the results of the study? So we wanted to know if the attachment style predicts problems for people who um, come for predictive testing, and we see that indeed persons with high attachment anxiety experience more distress after testing, and their um, negative emotions last, last longer than people who have a secure attachment style. They experience a lack of support, as can be predicted from such an attachment style, and as we know, they are vulnerable for psychological problems. So we think that screening for attachment anxiety in the practice of predictive testing, for instance, can help predict who will need additional psychological support. Now, these are the three studies that we did, and what can we do with the results of these studies? Well, the first thing is that I think it's important to be aware that children growing up in HD families are at risk for adverse childhood experiences, so there's um, a risk that they experience things that other people would maybe not experience, and therefore they are at risk of having an insecure, of de developing an insecure attachment style. So logically, we think it would be wise to strive for prevention in families raising children at the moment. And an important thing is that if there are any psychiatric, psychiatric problems of the HD parent, then it's really essential that these are diagnosed as early as possible and that the parent receives uh, adequate treatment from a psychiatrist. And the second important thing is that um, we could offer relationship enhancement programs for couples. There is a program that is called Hold Me Tight, 
which is based on um, a judgment uh, um, theory, and it helps people um, and enhance and, and enforce their own uh, relationship, though, so they can cope better with um, uh, the disease that they are facing. And the third thing is that we can do to prevent problems is um, we could help parents who have HD uh, to raise their children safely by using psychological programs. There is a good program that has been evidence-based and uh, is well uh, described and used. It's a, a, a program that increases parent sensitivity and promotes more positive parent-child interactions, so you can expect um, that the chance of having a secure attachment style is increased. And of course, in the stressful period of predictive testing, we know that we have to offer psychological support, additional psychological support for persons who have attachment anxiety. And lastly, as we are doing now, I think, uh, we could educate family members and professional about, vet professionals about the risks and about the possibilities for prevention. So the take-home messages of my talk today is that um, a child with HD can have consequences throughout life. Again, it's not um, it's not true for everyone, but it's good to know what the risks are. We know that persons who come from a family where a parent has HD have more adverse or negative childhood experiences. We know that these persons are more, more likely to have an insecure or anxious attachment style. And we know that persons with an anxious attachment style need more psychological care when they come from predictive testing because of the longer lasting problems. And lastly, prevention for the next generation is, in my mind, essential. So that is basically what I wanted to talk about today. So Thank you I hope much. it was all clear. It was excellent. Thank you very much, Lucienne. Very, very good. Well, thank you. Um, well, Ben's still here, so I don't know if we have a question from Ben or not. Um, Feel free to type away, Ben, if you do. Yeah. Um, but yeah, very interesting. And for us, when we were when we saw this presentation, it was fascinating. And uh, for, of course, because we work with young people on a day in day yes. basis. Yes. And most of us are from HT families, so we've experienced it as young people as well. We know the the impact that HT has. On, on young people, but yes. it's obviously displaying that in a scientific, evidence-based way is the yes. most important thing that, that can help you reach new places. So yes. seeing what you put out there was really fantastic. So so thank you for doing that work in the first place. Yeah. And it just goes to show that we've, we've got a lot more to do. I think um, slide nine with the results for the, you know, um, with the ACE study. Yes. It's just um, the challenges that young people face. Is so Absolutely. there are so many, and um, yeah, I think we need to highlight that as much as we can. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Um, I don't think Ben has any questions. Um, um I maybe he has. He's muted. Yeah, he's muted at the moment. I can unmute him if you want to. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Hi, Ben, any questions? No, I think he's okay. Okay, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, really, really good stuff, uh, Lucien, and thank you very much for, for wanting to, to come on today and do that, and... Um, I think it will be very useful for, for families and I think also for parents especially to see, to hear the impact that it can have and also professionals who work with those HD families, of course. Yes, yes. Um, and I, I definitely want to get you to Glasgow next year for a talk there at our Young Adult Congress. So I'll speak to you more about that. Absolutely. Well, if there are any other questions, please let me know. Um, so thank you for the opportunity to 
I think Ben Waters is. No, he's on. Uh... Okay. He's on. A, he's in a car, I think. <laughs> okay. Fine. Okay. So shall I um, close the? Um... Yep. That's yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll speak to you later. Thank, Thank you very much, Lucian. Have a good yeah. day. Bye, bye, folks. Bye, bye, Ben. Have a good one. I'll stop.